Welcome, you're listening to a Rollmaster Classic actual play set in Terry K. Anthra's excellent Shadow World using Fantasy Grounds. You can find session summaries, items and characters on Obsidian Portal, where our campaign is called The Praise of Old Men. This episode is cross-references Chapter 3, Demons of the Burning Night, Part 11. We're also on YouTube, Podbean and Twitch, where you can find the various links as well as an index of some of the main points of each episode in the description. Previously, after getting into the Kragora room, the party resolved to head back to the pirate stockade. We join them in this episode as they discuss how to handle the untrustworthy inhabitants. You decided, new well, I, um, I don't know if you've caught put on or at all. Basically, they've looted the place, but they had a bit of a dilemma in that they came across a large number of items, including, worst of all, probably that hourglass, um, which essentially could lay waste to a town or a city. They found all of these items, which rather than being locked away for people to find, were locked away so that nobody could get hold of them. There were a few weapons as well, um, but they sort of pale compared to some of the other things that the party found. Weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, the, certainly the uh, the hourglass. Yeah. So what the party decided was they want to destroy these things. They've got a host of weapons, you know, swords and and so on to now go into this city Tarak Nev and go toe to toe with the demons ghosts and so on that are there to try and find these um, portal rods which is why you've come here but what they also want to do is to destroy a lot of the items that they found which they put back in a chest the issue is they don't want to get the chest out of the temple trog it through the jungles to the stockade. Remember there's that stockade with the um, pirates that have got stranded who you don't quite trust. They're led by that huge sort of uh, almost seven foot tall bearded redhead um, thug. Now you guys don't quite trust him and uh, his shipmates. Uh, the ship was called the Scourge and um the uh, captain was a guy called aroth to cal if if name serves me right but i'll double check that in a minute so what you kind of agreed is you're going to get out of the temple summon your ship somehow you might have to go back to the stockade to do so summon your ship get your ship get your ship back to the temple get the chest onto it and then dump the chest into the volcano which smoulders and lurks on the northern edge of the island something like that so anyway. so, so, so just a couple of questions so so the sh just remind me the, sh the ship is the flying ship not the that's uh, right a flying ship hence you can get it to the temple second question is um give, given the give, given the the demons and you know the the challenges that lie ahead are, aren't we being a bit hasty in destroying or, or getting rid of some of these weapons or are they so awesome and and powerful that we couldn't even deploy them against the demons in tarant nev is, is that the conclusion we can yeah we wouldn't just be the demons in tarant nev would kill it be all the humans in the stockade and some of the outlying islands they're that powerful well it's not quite that powerful but they're very very evil Okay, last question then. Why would we even if why would we want to destroy such a powerful weapon? You know, just just say in our future there was a Baradur or a, you know the equivalent type of place. Could we deploy a weapon like this? Because it may get in the wrong hands. It's been buried in an extremely hard to find tomb on an island full of demons by someone who was trying to hide it in behind a magic proof locked cell, which we managed to open. So someone made a decision, probably, I guess, us in a previous incarnation, that this was a very bad thing to have around, and they they hid it. And we don't have anything as effective as that to hide it from. And no, no one really that we trust enough to give it to and keep it in safe hands. Yeah, we're that was part of it. We've destroyed all the guardians around that locked treasure, you know, as well. So it's going to be even easier for someone to just dream along. Yeah, we've, we've also got Silk in our party. He's almost certain to use it yes. in the future. So. Uh. <laughs> and yeah, and you're coming across very much, very much like Boromir in the in the in the council meetings. <laughs> it is a gift. It is a gift. <laughs> That's right. I don't know. I mean, well, I mean uh, there, there's, some bad, there's some bad um, operators in this world, I imagine. And uh, there are just to there throw are. away a weapon. 
And one simply doesn't just walk into Tarek Nev, does one? <laughs> That's right, maybe. <laughs> okay, do, you think, so, do you think if we chuck this weapon into Tarek Nev, the rods would survive and everything else would uh, perish? Or is this weapon so powerful to take out the whole island? Um, have a quick Sorry, check uh, at the... Yeah. Have, have a quick check. I know items. you've all made the decision, and I'll, um, so, so I'm so sorry. No, no. It's, on obsidian, the, it's on Obsidian the, Portal, as Stuart was saying, so you can read it all about it there. But yeah, you'll probably make the same decision once you've read it. Yeah, I mean, I think the Arrow Class, isn't that the one that you can smash and it just starts bringing itself back together again? Yeah, you can't That's even right. destroy that. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link to that in Discord for you so you can have a look at it. Uh, yeah, but it's pretty. That's pretty nasty. However, you did get some useful things. So there's a, um, they're not nearly as exciting. I mean, there's a carpet of meditation, which if you sit on it, it gives you a plus 25 bonus to your meditation skill. Um, I think Silk got irrationally excited about that. So did Ugnan. I'm a bit, I'm still scratching my head as to exactly how that's going to make you into world champions, but never mind. Half the sleep. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, well, you know, if that's the most powerful item you've ever had from a DM, a, a, a item that helps you sleep, you, you've really been unlucky. <laughs> well, partially um, that, and then if you get into a meditative state, you get a bonus for attunement of items as well, so it'll help that. In that is true, well. that is true. Silk, you're spoiling my, my mojo here. Silk <laughs> is absolutely right. Um, that will help. I think more exciting than that, um, and I think there was a oop when I told uh, people, you have got a carpet of flying. Um, that was it. Well, yeah. So, so you have got some useful things amongst them. Not everything was evil and must be destroyed. Um, but anyway, you've decided that you want to leave the stuff in the chest and to go back to the stockade where Aroth Tikal and his mercenaries are. You'll remember that there are, I think, seven of them: Porgno, uh, Pestrel, Kellock, Jahod, Urn, Avarok, and. Aroth to Cal, who's the sort of big, hulking, warhammer-wielding uh, captain of the Scourge. Their story is that they were sailing across the boiling seas. Their ship got attacked by um, a huge sea serpent, and they've been stranded on the island ever since. You, if you can recall, you reached a fairly uneasy, truth, uneasy truce with them. Um, if I just show you a quick or reveal the map of the stockade. Um, so you explored their stockade. That map is coming through now, uh, complete with um, strange obsidian spire at the centre. Um, and the kind of last thing you did before you headed off to the temple was silk and I think cherry. Silk's clever use of long door, I think, it got you inside that obsidian tower and allowed you to explore it. And I'll send you that as well. Um, it did have a door, but it was cunningly hidden. Uh, you made your way up from the ground floor, which is to your sort of left hand side, to the second floor where there were just barrack beds. There was a ladder going up to a top floor, which you guess is where this great hulking red bearded captain sleeps. Um, there were loads and loads of bookcases there, you'll remember, and uh, Silk and Cherry uh, stole a couple of books to keep Ugnan happy. Meanwhile, the rest of you down below, story that you were going to wander off into the jungle, you were exploring. You'd been very careful to keep Aroth and his crew away from your airship. Um, obviously, Aroth... Um, is keen to get he and his crew off, and he's tried every way he can to negotiate with Cran, um, use of the airship, help getting off the island, and so on. As you left things, Cran, you not quite promised Aroth to Cal, but you assured him that you'd help his crew escape from the island, because, of course, they're stranded. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so before we get back, as we're kind of strolling through the beautiful buttercup fields, it is. Surrounded by demons on all sides. Uh, yeah. We'll just have a quick chat about that before we get back, just so everyone's on in agreement of what we should offer them. So I kind of say, well, uh, well, chaps, remember, I did kind of say we'd help them get off the island. Don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but I think they're a dangerous bunch of fuckers. So I think we should just like drop them off somewhere or come back with a boat and let them 
sign themselves up for something. What do you think? Well, can, uh, we de- can we disarm them or have them disarmed when we take before they come on our ship so they don't try and yeah, yeah even even with the it. disarming, there's quite a lot of the bastards and they're hard men, so I wouldn't yeah I wouldn't trust them. Well, yeah, we, we could trust them. Indeed, you would, at least you'd have an advantage if they tried to. It's very simple. We'll do it because they're that desperate. I'm sure they'd do anything. So they they drop the weapons. They uh, agree to be tied up. Uh, we'll have used a lot of provisions by then, so we can keep them uh, in a corner under guard somewhere. And like you said, big lad, as soon as we get into a decent bit of a uh, land mass, we just drop them off at the first opportunity. They should be happy about that. Give them their weapons back. Should be it. Yeah, that work. They seem to at least trust us as far as things went before we entered that obelisk. <laughs> yeah, I think they're just trying to keep us sweet, really, so that they bring we bring that airship within their grasp and they'll they'll try and grab it. Mm-hmm. So they, didn't I think, know, uh, they didn't know we entered the obelisk, did they? So they you've got certain assets that may, may have influenced their appreciation of us, if I'm being well, honest. Well, that's true. Yeah. There's I mean, a reason might, they wear my dresses tight. <laughs> that might be something you'll have to take care of. They obviously noticed um, the fact that, you've, if you remember, both Cherry and Silk got um, some some attention that was probably not exactly desired. Yeah. Don't that be so hasty! <laughs> catch me, catch me! <laughs> no, uh, Ugnin has the perfect hourglass shape as well. I can loan him <laughs> one of my dresses. Yeah, broken hourglass is trying to bring itself together. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss this. Well, so, one, th- one thing is... Uh, Thinking ahead, if we get into Tarek Nev and we get what we want, we'd probably hopefully get the airship to pull us straight out of there, almost like a kind of evac. Um, yeah. Could we use that to advantage and tell these pirates, look, that's where we're getting picked up at, and maybe even use them as um, I don't want to say fodder because that'd be quite an evil thing to say, but you know, as a, as um, as frontline troops. Uh, yeah. They... <laughs> They're not going to, even with the kind of firepower we've got, we're going to be hard pressed. I wouldn't, I, there are any, I don't know, ruffians in the Edu Wells, pirates. They're not kingpins in the underworld, I wouldn't have thought so. No, they're not. Okay, so I suppose then it's just if it's the decent thing or not. Do, do we come back for them? And really, I think Ugnan's not an evil man, so he'd be, would want to come back for them. The issue you've got, I think think is so your crew on your airship um is small so there's you six your crew number's about six uh Aroth leads a crew himself uh, or a gang of uh six as well so in terms of numbers you're going to obviously have to show some caution um because if Aroth and his crew manage to best you then he's got control of the airship if Aroth best the crew on your airship in any reason for any way or tries to have a go at the fight. Though, having said that said, there's no evidence at all that Aroth or his crew have got the first idea of what to do with an airship. That that takes a particular skill, so... Yeah, and if I'm being honest, there's one thing about stealing a ship, there's another stealing an airship, which is probably worth a hundredfold and has extremely powerful owners, so, yeah, that, that would be... Yeah, that you don't want to mess with. Yeah. Arkana, I'll, yeah. I'll leave... I'll leave uh, Veracity the general to uh, come up with a suitable threat to them about why they would be very stupid to try and take the ship by force. But I'm all on on for taking them on board. They'd actually probably be quite useful to leave on the ship while mm, yeah. reverse that. But yeah, so, we could bring them on board once we leave the island, maybe. So it gets really excited and says, and besides... If they do take it, we can try one of the portals. <laughs> <laughs> Ugly slapping his forehead. Karan <laughs> rolls his eyes and shakes his head. <laughs> yeah. Shakes okay, so sky. the journey back, if you follow the back to the um, to the stockade, remember the stockade has been there quite some time and these pirates um, mercenaries have um, renewed the planking, renewed the timber on the outer stockade. They haven't built it, they've just renewed it. This has obviously been a home for numbers of other shipwrecked sailors who presumably have perished. 
if you remember, there are no stories of anybody sailing to the island of Aranmore and returning. Mm -hmm. You're also aware that you've got about a week before your rivals are probably imminently going to descend on the island themselves. You remember the minister, this uh, fugitive in Sel Kai, has been tasked with redeeming himself by leading a ship to come to Aaron Moore as well for various items, uh, which I don't think have been disclosed to you. You, they're coming by conventional ship. You came by airship, and therefore have got a considerable advantage in time. You've got about a week, perhaps slightly less, before they're due to arrive. And they're going to come with a ship. If they can survive the seas, if they can survive the great serpents which infest the seas around Aaron Moor, um, that will be another vessel which could offer hope to Aaron and his me. Anyway, what they could do is help them take that ship and then let them use it as their own afterwards. You could do my enemy's enemy is friend. Yeah, because the other. I vaguely remember having some kind of conversation about we could do with good captains as part of our wider crew of burgeoning traders, <laughs> trading in fine wine, spirits and beers or whatever. Uh, yes. Trading it. Um, and he that did seem to be a highly competent sailor, as far as I recall. Yeah, Aroff, um, just talking to him. I mean, he's still got both legs. He doesn't wear, um, you know, uh, one of those white sweaters and doesn't have a pipe. But everything else about him bespokes um, a son of the sea. And you probably even notice that he removes the odd barnacle from time from his ass. But yeah, he does sound like a competent sailor. Not that you're an expert, Cram, but talking to him, he probably comes across as more of a warrior than a seaman. But that's the nature of being a pirate. Certainly his vessel, the Scourge, and his crew seem very, very loyal. That's any indication. Because if we set him up with basically with a new ship, even though I, we help him take it, he has to fight for it himself, we'll help fight for it. And then offer him, I don't know, him and his crew 50% of all takings. That's still, we're still ahead, aren't we, in that? And we may have a loyal captain for life. I don't think it crosses as well because... <laughs> Where is his, he's got a ship, we've got a sky ship, so uh, that kind of trumps him, uh, all ends up. Yeah, and you could negotiate with him and see he's got six men. He might want you to help him take control of the ship. He might then prove to be a loyal friend, a servant. Um, you won't know until you try, I suppose. You know that the journey back from this hidden temple, uh, the temple of um, the Forgotten Knight, it's about oh, uh, half a day's trek through the jungle. You'll recall you were warned by Aroff to avoid certain places as being dangerous. And you yourselves came across an open ground of moss, which gave mm -hmm. you um, the willies. There were things moving under the moss. I remember that. Oh, yeah. And ripples. And rather than moving across quite easy, gentle, undulating moss covered ground, you took a slightly more awkward route and followed the riverbank. As it was, that actually probably worked out best because it meant you, you know, the town ended up being almost on the river itself. Yeah. I'm assuming you want to follow the same route back. Yeah, yeah definitely. Rather than being bold and heading off a completely different direction like a typical student D of E group. Okay? And I think there was some threat from the trees possibly, so we're going to keep half an eye on that as well. Yes, Aroth had said basically almost everything that lives on the island style. You've seen, obviously, these great um, sort of uh, sentient ape creatures, the, um, I've gone blank on what they're called now. Um, Garks. Garks. Thank you, Garks, that's right. That you had to scare away. These things can use weapons as well. Fairly primitive, but they can use them. They infest the trees. But there are also other strange creatures as well, which you've been told don't take prisoners, don't communicate and just kill. Uh, and they're the things that have got rid of so many stranded mariners in the. You might recall that Aroth's crew um, were far more numerous when they first landed. And he's recorded on the ship's wheel, which they rescued and um, which has a pride of place in the stockade. They've recorded some of the names 
of the people that have died on the island. So the island is quite treacherous. Okay, you head back to the stockade. Can you all give me perception rolls, please, as you approach? Um, just normal perception rolls will do. Oh, crept um, over the wire. Look at that. Silks and... gazing up at the cloud formations again. Look. Ooh. I really was. Are you still here? After after seeing that SD roll, I thought, oh, God, what's she done? No, no. <laughs> Headed north towards the volcano. <laughs> I've already <laughs> got the hourglass to get Anyone got the hourglass? <laughs> yeah, did any of you check? A serious, more seriously, did any of you check? Because you do know what Silk is like. Ah. Did any of you check what Silk left the temple with? <laughs> no. Don't you say that. So don't I take know. this offensively, but strip all your clothes off. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but all of a Put sudden, my prison wallet. All of a sudden, the carpet <laughs> takes to the air, and Silk says, "Look, I've got the hourglass. Everything will be fine." That's right. <laughs> I'm going to end this once and for all right now. Okay, so from a distance, um, you can all see that the um, stockade gates are open. And you can see the familiar sight of uh, a couple of mercenaries patrolling the stockade. One of the first indications you had that Aroth's crew were quite disciplined and more than just starving survivors was the fact that he disciplined them sufficiently so that they keep a regular watch. They're alert on watch with weapons to hand after weeks and weeks and weeks of um, incessant heat and the hum of mosquitoes and other insects. Anyway, you can see two men uh, on duty patrolling. Uh, Cran and Silk recognise them. Cran, you can see that there's a man called Avarok, who you sort of remember vaguely. Avarok has a huge two-handed sword, and he's got a curiously old-fashioned shirt that's a uh, chain, but made of uh, quite fine brass links. A um, little bit old-fashioned, but it works. Uh, hey, so Avarok, how are you doing? Avarok looks up and waves, and he shouts across to his friend. You recognise his friend, unfortunately, Silk, as Jahod, or Jahod. Uh, Jahod is one of the men who noted your um, uh, attributes. Huge and hulking. Um, he doesn't seem to have any weapon. Quite proud of the fact that, mo that no man has stood up to his right hand. Um, something that he's quite proud of. Not that he says that around um, Aroth, who is just huge. Uh, and it's Jahod who's been um, more than friendly, Silk. However, uh, the pair of them call down um, to the stockade. You've been gone probably a little over a day, to be honest. You don't look the worse for wear. And after a while, you can see Aroth make way up from the jungle and from the riverbank into the drier, sandy area that, su that surrounds the palisade, you can see Aroth uh, take his position. You're back then. You all right? Well, yeah. Can't you all? There's the, so basically, thanks for the advice about the uh, the, the moss place, the nice place, and we, we headed straight to that, that temple place and uh, had a few problems with some gark, but apart from that, and untold undead, uh, everything went swimmingly. All right. You, uh, you, you find anything then, and you can see him. He's obviously uh, quite a close look at you, at what you're carrying. This um, and that. As if... uh, basically, Cran sinks up to his ankles in the soft earth under the weight of weaponry on his back. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be carrying <laughs> stuff as well, probably carpets or wherever. That's all right. Al wouldn't. <laughs> You know, you could be carrying a Ford Fiesta back. Arthur. Nothing to eat, boy. <laughs> Nothing to eat, unfortunately. Just uh, okay. old, old bits um, of tuft. Old bits of gear. Okay. All right. Avarok is a little bit more observant. Um, so he peers across. And you can see he whispers uh, something to Aroth. And Aroth has another squint. Uh, he can't help but notice your sword, Cran. Uh, great big two-handed sword that it is. It's only seven foot long. That's even taller than Yeah, Cran. exactly. Yeah, well, you know, perception roll of 52. Like I said, you could carry it. Is, is that, 
he, quite actually has two two-edged swords. He's also got a scythe about the same length with some blade each end and then a massive That's battle. not how you're really walking with all this. We actually uh, have him on a cloak and we're dragging him everywhere we go. <laughs> <laughs> Just pointing uh, in the right direction. And where's my... Right, right now, Crank can't actually, his perception's at minus 100 because he's just got it in both arms and it's just stacked above his eyesight. <laughs> well, all of you have, I think all of you have blades and new weapons and uh, Avarok has indicated to Aroth that you've got that. And Avarok looks at you and says, oh, you, you found a weapon cache then? Was that yeah, we, need, we needed that to go and take the fight to these demons on the island. So uh, got that now. But I've um, got a proposition for you, big lad. And he looks at Agnan and goes quite like that phrase and then uh <laughs> he, he says um <clears throat> you need to get off the island we know that within a week there's going to be another ship here basically looking for the same stuff but they're nasty men on that ship we don't like them but we're very prepared to hate to help you uh take the ship on one important criteria that is you become part of our trading group afterwards uh Keep the ship. You get fifty percent of any of the takings. We keep fifty percent. We set you up again. You get off to the island. Everyone's happy. What do you say? Aroth folds his arm and he says, "Interesting, interesting. Why don't you bring your your crew in uh, into the stockade? Um, sure, you're uh, you're in need of something to eat and drink. Uh, um, we can talk some more about this. Bring your lads in." Oh, and, and the ladies, and you can see that uh, one of the others looking at um, looking at your silk appreciatively. I uh, drop something and go and bend over and pick it up with no knee. You okay? No knee dip. Okay. Bloody hell, silk! Stop it. <laughs> okay. So when you come into the stockade, you've got the map there. So you come in through the main gates. They close those gates. A couple of men are left sort of on duty. If you recall, apart from the obsidian sphere that there is at the centre, there are three other sort of small buildings. There's a small privy across in the northwest corner. And in the southeast and southwest, there are two buildings. The building to the southeast, which is the slightly nicer of the two, uh, whereas the pirates, brigands, cutthroats, they sort of crowded into the other. Anyway, all of the crew are out in a number. They're preparing what looks like some sort of wild goat or pig over a fire. Uh, you can see the fire on your mat. And our often motions for you to sit down or rest points across to the room or rather the uh, shack that you've used before. And uh, again, he notices the weapon and he says, uh, those look like some nice blades. Can you get those? Yeah. Are there any more? Uh, not in there to be found, but if I'm being honest, I've got too many. I'll throw in a bit of a sweetener if you want, if you join us. You look like the sort of man who's worthy of a blade like this. He looks at you and says, uh, maybe, maybe there's, uh, do you, you want to, um, how far away is this temple then? Because we, we we've never visited it, you see. Left it alone, didn't know if it was, you know, haunted. Covered with garks it was when... Last we scouted it. Is it, uh, is it safe? Yeah, no, def- definitely not safe. <laughs> not anymore, you, lad. <laughs> you, you, you boys aren't, aren't geared to do that. Uh, no. There's nothing left in it. We've got everything out of there, but uh, oh. safe is not the word I'd use. No, no, we are. Right. Let's just say we opened the door we shouldn't have. <laughs> Spilling out they are right. now. We close the door, try to seal it before us. I wouldn't go in there if I was you, lad, um, unless you've got about three times as many people we've got here right now. You ever seen creatures um, wrapped in bandages? Dead, but alive? Well, it's crawling with them there. Okay, he doesn't seem particularly worried, but you get the feeling that he's noting the fact that your group that include two women, and therefore, probably in his eyes, probably not as handy in inverted commas, as his own crew. But he doesn't make a big deal about it. He's quite interested in your deal, Cran, and he says, so uh, So when is this other ship supposed to land? And where's your airship from? When's that yeah. picking you you fellas up? Uh, on our signal. The other ship's going to be here about a week's time. We've got a limited time. We're, we're here 
Fucking hell, actually, I'm here to fulfil a prophecy with these boys and girls. We found oh, out about recently. A prophecy. Yeah, a prophecy. it sounds fucking it sounds fucking ridiculous, doesn't it? Me from it does. fucking icy wastes, just being a mercenary my whole life. I'm apparently some important person in a prophecy. But... Can you can you all give me perception? As the conversation just begins to carry on, just give me a quick perception rolls, please. Normal perception rolls will be fine. Thank you. Ooh, Cran, nicely done. Cran's a suspicious bugger. Goodness me, all of you rolling over 100. Um, <laughs> Alf Unless it's crew, binary. Yeah. Alf leads a crew of six. Three men are now sort of patrolling the walkways, but only one of them is sort of towards the north. The other two are hanging around the gate. None of them have missile weapons. A pair of them are sort of staring down at your group as you sit around the fire. One man doesn't seem to be present. The other two are basically tending to the food, which smells actually quite decent. Though these uh, Arabs crew are more fighters, probably, or come across as more fighter than sailor, they can at least prepare food uh, that, that's fit to eat. And certainly the smell of uh, fresh roasting uh, goat is better than anything else. Anyway, Arof mm -hmm. is interested in your, in your deal. He obviously asks you a few more questions about your ship. He glances across at Cherry and Silk. Um, and he's clearly a little bit suspicious about this temple. So, uh, so you managed to get out. None of you seem that, that badly injured. Look at the grease in my friend Ugnin's uh, hair and beard. That uh, that bandaged one almost sucked the life out of a... I'll, I'll lean over and just whisper to Silk. Uh, look, I know men like this. They need some fucking big display of, I don't know, magic or something. They don't believe a woman would be able to do anything to help our crew. And looking around, they're, they're a tough bunch of bastards. So anything you could do to... Um, should we say show off uh, your skills a little bit would be helpful. It may actually keep some hands off you as well. At which point Ugnan goes white and says, not those skills, not those skills. <laughs> yeah. So no, there's demon skin. Call a <laughs> demon? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> At which point Silk says, well, fortunately, I brought back the hourglass. How about I use... <laughs> okay, Silk, do you want to give them a brief display of magic or do you just to... I'm checking my level in the overcasting right now. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, okay, there's a fireball, actually. That's my level now. So I'll, I'll take a couple of rounds, two rounds, to, and I'll chant shouting, screaming, gesticulating wildly. Of course. And I'll make sure the, the fireball lands on top of the obelisk so it's a bright display where the sphere will be perfectly <laughs> surrounding it. You incinerate their, their, uh, their <laughs> yes. palisade, which is made of wood. No, no, way above it, like I say, <laughs> so that it doesn't, they'll feel the heat of it. All right, it's make a, um, make a spell cut. To just not fumble it. So Silk begins yeah. to prepare a spell and the crew go quiet. They're oh, so st stand practicing. back, boys. Yeah. <laughs> At which point Silk basically gesticulates wild, thrusts out with her hands, and there's a great ball of orange um, energy which appears. Or, do you, or does it fly from your hand, Silk? Yeah, flies from my hands. I'll reach back really dramatically and chuck it sidearm style way up in. The... Okay, so you uh, attempt to knuckle the, um, the uh, obelisk. So there's a great ball, probably about the size of a uh, uh, a large basketball, appears over the uh, obelisk and it shatters into spark, which rain down, but of course don't dissipate before they hit the ground. Most of the crew flinch and duck back. Uh, one almost uh, ducks underneath the walkway. Aroff, too, you can see, is visibly not shaken, but he's aware of the power that you wield, Silk. And he nods, purses his lips, and you've probably got the message across that um, you're not to mess with. So it's, it's um, like this. As a, as a, sorry, God, no, but... No, it's like like this, Arif. That's a little skinny elf. She can do that. Points to Sharna. Her, you won't be able to lay a hand on, but she'll break you in half. Well, not you personally, but anybody who tries it. See her, to Cherry. Get away with her with a bow or a blade, or she can be sneaky as, as she likes. Those three are bloody deadly. 
you know the big lad he'll split you in two and you see the girly elf sorry the the the, the elf <laughs> over there looks at looks at yarn says many many <laughs> as many many <laughs> skills okay, and me uh... i'm a good cook I'm just a good cook. <laughs> Pat's his belly. At which point, yeah, I was going to say, Pat's his belly and says, and me, I can fart for England. Right, uh, <laughs> give me a presence roll, please, Ugnan, because I don't think there's any sort of... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> At uh, which point you probably mutter, I think. Um, okay. Was that okay? <laughs> yeah. That was where you do add a. I'll, mm-hmm. I'll turn around and wink, wink at Cran. I think I've got him, lad. <laughs> yeah. Cran, obviously, what, what Ugnan has said is obviously supposed to really impress Ar- uh, Aroth. He's, he's impressed, but um, the great words that Ugnan came out with, well, yeah, bluster, bluff, and you know, as they say, dogs that bark haven't got much bite. It's the dog that doesn't <laughs> bark that you're worried about, really. I didn't um, like, she makes the boom boom, she makes so, the bang bang. <laughs> I, I will <laughs> kind of say, look, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look, you look like you've seen some service, probably some, some tough nights, some, probably some tough sieges you've been with. I have to been in a lot of campaigns and I will have to say there is not a single one of these I've replaced with anyone I ever fought with before. It's not tough people aren't just big and can wield swords like you and me. I wouldn't fancy taking any of these people on individually. Glad they're at, glad they're at my back. Give me a presence roll, Cran. So you, you are fucking kidding. Your, <laughs> on the shoulder. Negative. Sorry, not, uh, yeah, um, yeah, I need a presence. So again, there you go. Whoa. Okay, so Aroth kind of waves and says, "Yeah, yeah, all right." So, uh, all right, so so I guess your your crew are, crew are handy. So tell me then, and he sits down, which you take as that okay now with him. Yeah, I'll, I'll sit down uh, with him and I'll get my bat- battered old brandy flask out and offer it to. Him. I'll stir all the right. cooking pot. He, all right, he <laughs> nods, yeah, <laughs> and try not to be noticed. Anyone got any oregano? Yeah. <laughs> you know that um, was it in the uh, oh in the anchor man where one of them says, "Well, that quickly escalated, didn't it?" <laughs> uh, um, wow, I, I'm a whole cheese wheel. I'm, I, I'm not even mad. I mean, um, so uh, you start stirring the food, and the others taking their cue from Aroth. You can kind of feel that they're treating you with a little bit more respect. They may not like. You. they may not you may not trust them but they're certainly wary of you now rather than looking at you as victims who they're biding their time on you're no longer the box that they thought you were um Aroth looks is, is the way that they're looking at silky changed in any way, the way yes at uh, definitely cherry as well the men are still on duty but they're now looking a little interested in what's going out in the jungle rather than waiting for a cue from Aroth basically to attack you and probably strip you of all your belongings. They're now going to deal you with a little bit of certainly more caution and respect. You probably now feel a little bit safer. Way Still going to have to be careful around them, as well as... but you're going to have to be safer. Um, the fact that Ugnan was willing to speak up, even if he wasn't quite convincing, the fact that Silk clearly has mighty magic at its disposal, Cran is a great big hulking brute of a, a man, you know, six Cran and big with it across the chest and shoulders and scarred. Aroth is going to talk to you, and that's a significant achievement. So Aroth looks at you, Cran, and says, uh, right, so uh, this ship then that's going to be coming in, who is it from? Who crews it? Then uh, I'll look at Ugnan and go, I'll shrug my shoulder. I don't really know much about it. I was a bit bored when it came to that bit uh, at a conversation. But Nasty, look, uh, you heard about uh, you heard of the Iron Wind, Iron Bell, basically people who'd like the undeath to take over this world. So the demons here, they love them to be all over the place. One of them ones who's leading it up, he's, he's caused a few problems. He's, we've caused him a few problems, uh, and he's now on his last chance. So he's coming over here. 
uh, to retrieve some items from the city. We'll have them before then. We'll have a nice ambush waiting. We'll put them to the sword or whatever we have to do. Empty, sh empty ship, as the big lad says. If you want to take it on, then you take it on. All right, so what you're suggesting is then we help you ambush this crew and we get the ship. And in return for your help, we we'll get the ship. And because we've helped you, we're going to be trading partners, something like that. You want us to, because you've helped us guide it. Yeah, we'll go as far as that, that yet. Yeah. Our offer, we're, we don't know you yet. We don't trust you. Uh, clearly, you've got some capabilities in your crew, hopefully sailing has been one of them. You're not, if I'm being blunt, you haven't really got much option. We're going to take the ship with or without you. But if you want to help out and you want to demonstrate some of your worth so we can see you in action, that's what we're inviting you to do. It ain't no partnership yet. This is going to be you working for us, but we will give you, and you you know this game, we're going to give you half of the value of any sales of trade, um, which is well beyond what a ship's crew would normally get. I'll leave it up to you, Arif, to divide that out amongst your, your crew. All right. Cran, give me, can you all perception roles first, because you're all sort of listening to this. Um, I don't think there's a better role there's nothing like intuitions or anything like that um, or sense motive. So give me, okay, right. So so as uh, Cran speaks to Aroth, all of you are around there. Um, at the mention of the ship, taking over a ship, um, Ognan, uh, Numel and Silk, you're aware that, yeah, that's definitely piqued his interest. He wants to get off. Cran, you'd be aware of that too. However, as soon as Cran started talking about the fact that, you know, prove your worth, uh, you're going to help us, um, you haven't got any choice. Aroth is a very, very proud man. Ugnan, you were definitely aware. As soon as that intimation that Aroth needed you was made, Aroth became not uneasy, but you can see there's a red flush to his face. Um, Aroth is clearly very, very proud, leading a band of quite, you suspect, quite vicious cutthroat. He has to be the alpha male. Any hint that he's not alpha in any day and his men could turn against him. So he's, you, know, you, have, you haven't made him cross, but he, he's getting a little bit het up. So he looks at you, Cran, and he says, so, uh, so you, you want me and my lads to prove ourselves to you but we'll get 50 percent of anything what that we ship is that right any trading value profit. any yeah any any anything we trade when it's sold you get 50 percent of the profits you'd be taking risk you know the risks at sea i like you i like you and your crew i think you could do this job not only that i think the fact you survived here it's got some real discipline around camp that's probably down to you it's impressed me i wouldn't be making the offer otherwise but we don't know you yet i know these fellas here i could trust them with my life we've only just met you um right. what, what about what i like about you big lad is that the first night we we're here you clearly were underestimating us and you thought we might be marks but you didn't make your moves you gave us a chance and that's what that's what i like about that mate he um he calls over to one of the men, Porgno, and you suspect that Porgno might be, at some point, may have been a second fairly important person. Porgno has a scimitar, and you suspect he's carrying some sort of uh, blowgun with him. He's got what looks like a long, hollow bamboo pole, and you can see there are some darts, uh, quite crude ones, stuck in his belt. Porgno, you've heard all this. 50% trading. What do you reckon? Porgno grins, showing um, quite disarmingly white, even teeth. Um, and he smiles and says, mm, He's from the Upper West Side. <laughs> yeah, sorry. There's no <laughs> I say. Trading. How awfully fun. Um, <laughs> Porgno looks across and says, Trading. Trading, no bus. I, trading. What do we know about trading? The pirates, we fight, we kill, trading. No, no, is this Pog? No, no, trader. Uh, base, no, no, Pog, no, not trade. Is uh, no, and he makes a dismissive notion and turns back to patrolling. Haroff looks at you and says, 
look, I'm so, I'd like to help you, uh, Cram, but you heard it. We'll help you take the ship. In fact, we'll take the ship. Your help would be greatly appreciated, uh, and I'll owe you a debt. But you, you know my crew, look at us. Do we look like traders? We ain't going to be trading silks and fine wines. Um, that's, that's not what we do. Oh, I'd have thought that a year ago, but look at me now. And I looked down at myself covered in shit, blood, and, uh, and ripped clothing and going, hasn't changed me. All right, Aroth reaches over and slaps you on the shoulder, Cran, and grins. Can you give me a perception roll, folks, please? Sorry for, for all of these rolls. It's the best way I know uh, getting through this. Give me some perception rolls. Don't have to be in the tower. You can make them in the open, it's fine. I'll put my hand uh, on his on his opposite shoulder and uh, I think I think we've got <laughs> an understanding. Okay. Um, I think you're gonna bloody yeah. kiss. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Aroth says, hey, no tongues. Uh, Aroth, um, you've done, you've made the right gesture. One of um, trust, it's a bit like grasping another <clears> one <throat> in your sort of forearm. And Aroth says, look, we ain't traders. Uh, you help us get this ship. So you're the boss of a trading cup, right? You run traders and ships. Uh, well, we uh, part of the crew. Uh, if I'm being honest, Ugman's the brains behind the behind the whole proceedings. Okay, he looks at, well, looks at you. I'll look over at Cherry actually and say, "Well, actually, no offense, Ugman, but I reckon Cherry's the brains behind the brain. <laughs> Yeah, oh, I don't know. she's let's, definitely let's a traitor. Forget, let's not forget the grand Ugnan conjectures, which have very true. much of the devious plots. Okay, so Aroth looks across at Cherry and you, Ugnan, and shrugs and says, "Look." Whichever one of you is the boss, we ain't traders, but you've got a fleet, right? And that, that fleet of ships will need protection. Yeah? And you'll need to, uh, what's the word, uh, Paul? And Paul goes smiles and says, uh, diversive. <laughs> Harold says, yeah, you know, we'll need a diversive. So you want another come, won't you? You know, protection. I'll nod and sort of stuff. scratch my beard and say, um, don't understand a diverse whatever that was, but uh, I do quite like the idea that if there's some under the table stuff to be done, we've got a go-to guy we can trust to uh, to help out with that. What do you right. say to that, Aroth? Aroth smiles and says, "Yeah, I, I think we've got an accord." So, uh, Cherry, and he looks at you, Ugnan, um, and he says, "So, who am I talking to then? If I'm talking to boss, who am I talking?" To? Well, that's the uh, great thing about this little band of ours. There isn't a boss. We've no, all got our own little no, skill no, set. No, no. Aroth shakes his head. No, I need to know who I'm dealing with and who I come to if there's a problem. And I need to talk about a letter of mark. Who's going to sign my crews? And he sort of prods the ground. He's not angry, but he's being quite firm here. You get the sense that he wants this sorted out. Who am I talking to to sign my letter of mark? He looks across at you, Numa, and he clearly recognises that recognises you as an aquatic elf. Uh, and he yeah. says, "Well, it ain't him, is it?" Now I know he's probably gifted and everything, and he can't help but notice your swords. But he ain't the boss. No disrespect, Cran. It ain't you. I know your skill set is well. You know, it's like that big bastard over there. And he points to the guy who's been sort of showing his biceps at cherry from a distance and getting no interest whatsoever so you're probably like him right you're you're you know you're handy but who is signing my letter of mark i mean no disrespect lady and he looks at you still i doubt it's you is it because i know what you uh you know books and spells and i bet beneath you so it's either you fella and he looks at you Ugnan, or you miss can you all make perception rolls? God, who knew that one skill in roll master did every. Um, That's in my games too. I, they, that would be the oh, most we, developed. Yeah, we kind of almost need a house rule to develop equation and all the rest of it. Anyway, yeah. so clearly his vocabulary changed. He's referring to Silk as the lady, to Cherry as Miss, Pran, you know, by your first name. So he's clearly on your side, treating you with some respect. 
but he's clearly bothered by who the boss is. He's not at all impressed by, oh, we're a democracy, we share. So he looks at you, Ogden, and, uh, and he looks at Cherry, and he's saying, so come on, Crane, tell me, which of these am I dealing with? Who's signing my letter? I will, I will happily crew a ship under a letter of mark, any contraband we seize, any cargo we see, any ships we scuttle, we will share with you 50%. That is a great deal. But who am I working for? Cran, Cran's mind starts whirring and he's thinking back to uh, times in Selkine thinking, fucking hell, Ugnan absolutely loves paperwork. I seem to remember. <laughs> and then goes, uh, well, it, it's Ugnan. I don't. And then he sort of thinks, I can't Cherry actually write? <laughs> so, no, Cherry can't yeah. actually. No, and so uh, Ugnan's your man um, for, for, for signing the paperwork. Well, I'm, I'm, I think it's Cherry who's actually the one who's doing the wheeling, dealing and all the trading and that kind of stuff. The one who wanted to, was it, bought the wine, wanted to sell up the wine and then, then thought about right. the stuff. So I think you could think of Ugnan more as the kind of the clerk, the, the sort of like the, the, okay. the, pe the pa oh, paper so pusher. So, uh, well, she does the deals. He, he checks the writing, uh, what I call contracts. He does the contracts, but she, the she'll make the deals. And the cooking. <laughs> all right so so, so you negotiate with her and then you uh it will look over the contracts or what did you call them the marks and uh right. and it'll sign them on our behalf yeah i'd like to cook the books, cook the books. <laughs> yeah. terrible pun. all right <laughs> so alice is right okay so you miss you're actually in charge of this crew i get it i get it no offense that the big lady does uh, all of the talking. I understand that, but you're in charge. Um, Cherry would probably nod. Uh, probably look to Silk first just to make sure that he committed some terrible um, mistake. I give him a very imperious uh, glance from down my nose. Okay. And I nod. All right, so Cherry will agree. So to cut, the sh to, cut to the chase then, uh, folks, Aroth will, I'm not sure happily, but Aroth will agree with the crew to help you ambush the ship that comes in. But the planning is obviously up to you. You've got to work out when the ship's going to come in, where it's going to dock and so on. In return, he will sign basically a pirate's letter of money. So what that means is if, you get, if he gets into difficulty, such that uh, he needs funds, he needs a new ship, he needs crew, he needs anything like that, he could come to you and ask for money. Yes, he's making money himself, but if you want him to work for you, particularly the ship, if the ship needs replacing, if his ship needs major repairs, not major repairs, since you basically own his ship, he's going to come to you for the wherewithal to, to repair it. So it's like, like a merchant venture contract, i.e. Yeah, basically. You'll take some of the risk on with him. Yeah, so you well. take some of the risk, yeah. Um, the difficulty is, though, basically he is wanting you to sign off on the fact that you are aware that he go out and basically um, act as a pirate. He's going to uh, take ships, scuttle ships, sink ship, um, destroy crews, massacre crews, etc. The letter of mark means, though, you tell him who he can and cannot attack. OK, so that, that doesn't, that's more acceptable. We'll have to sign up the letter of mark and draw it up when we get to small civilised lands and we can yeah, discuss so you who can, we don't yeah. mind attacking and who we do. Numel has no. a question. Numel yep. has a question. So Numel, Numel turns to Aroth and he says, Aroth, do you currently have a letter of mark with somebody else? And are you suggesting that this new letter of mark would uh, repeal that letter? No. Uh, no letter of mark. Uh, the scourge, down its brave crew, and he wipes a tear from his eye. What's left of the, the scourge and its brave crew? Um, we were freebooters. So everything was our was our prey. Letter of mark, though, since you're willing to go 50 50, um, the way it works, fella, is uh, you tell us who we can attack and who we can't. We do the business that uh, you traders won't. 
uh, any cargo that we seize, we get half, you get half. Any ships that we seize, you either sell and give us half the profit or we come to some some arrangement. And that's the way it works. I lean over to Ugnan and I kind of whisper something to him, but I make a, a big show of it. And I, I basically, why don't we introduce them to my house, Elgata, who I'm pledged to as a knight? That's good thinking, lass. That way, we don't have any involvement with this, and House of God yeah, is, could do. is he also better does. equipped to handle. And also... If you remember, uh, Silk, or a memory roll, I don't mind either in memory. No problem. Silk, if you remember working for and house politics, merchant house politics in Selkai are quite unpleasant and messy. And if you can remember, there's already sort of a, a bitter rivalry which growing to the point of bloodshed between your house and another house. You remember there's been a mysterious death, um, the culprit of which hasn't been found, which you were beginning to get involved with before you left Selkai. Yeah. Um, you suspect as a loyal agent for the house that actually this could be a very valuable weapon for the house. They've now got, if you handle the negotiations right, a tough, hardened crew. If you can get them a vessel, that's fantastic. They've got a tough, hardened crew sailing a pirate vessel that is loyal, powder or a letter of market, something that pirate crews don't break uh, because they can never be trusted again. It's a little bit like, um, well, I don't know, a mercenary band of soldiers. If you bring track, nobody's going to hire you again because you trusted yeah like so being, our offing, like, that's right so our often saying well look we'll mark that's quite a big deal clearly cran's really generous suggestion you know the 50 percent profit which is huge um is significant and certainly going to help our get off the island Arov's crew in a ship could be very very valuable for however it would mean that would there would be a bunch of make no mistake is already out Aroth and his crew are murderers and killers and thugs. The only reason they didn't slaughter you as soon as you arrived to get off. The only reason Cherry, um, Shana and Silk weren't raped instantly is because they didn't know exactly who you were. Mm -hmm. Well, that won't be the same when they get off the island. So don't expect that this crew are going to go around and politely seize control of ships. They're going to do it in the most ruthless manner you can imagine. Right. So no, that's that's what I mean by us not being involved with them. But yeah, the you, you won't be the of course, depending on Ugnan's skill with a letter of mark, you could put in clauses about treatment of women, treatment of children. Um, you could forbid Aroth and his crew to sell any children or women into captivity. You could stipulate that women and children are to be treated with some respect, for example. So Aroth is quite happy to sign a letter of mark. It's something that as a uh, more of a seaman than you folks are, he knows of these things. What little you know, probably through silk, I suspect. But Cran is a, a, an experienced mercenary and uh, for want of a better phrase, hard case. Um, you know that pirates have a, or some pirates anyway, um, have sort of a peculiar code of honour that, that is to do with a contract. I suppose a letter of mark is equivalent, you suspect, to uh, a deed that mercenary bands will sign up to. So you reckon that as soon as we can get everybody uh, as soon as you've got something signed, Aroth will probably be good to the contract that you agree with him. Uh, or so, uh, Ugnan, master of the pen. Cran will just um, say, excuse me a minute, Aroth uh, and you boys, um, and I'll kind of lean over the table to whisper to my crew in a bit of a huddle. I quite, I really liked uh, Silk's idea of making this the Elgarda responsibility which incredibly powerful noble house wouldn't want a mercenary ship operating out of legal jurisdiction that's 
under their pay. Yeah, exactly. And I suspect I suspect that they've got enough funds there to dwarf whatever the these boys could make by stealing ships, like bolts of cloth and all the risks that entails. They'd be in danger, but they could direct them. It may actually work out well for everyone. Do we need to disclose, though? I mean, will Aroth have an issue with us just novating or assigning this letter of mark over to the Algatas without his consent? Well, great point. I mean, I think we need to wait until the Algatas have had a discussion. Have we worked for them or with them? Um, but I think we need to be straight with Aroth now. And actually, the potential for him is possibly bigger than becoming a pirate. I don't like the sound of this. His advisory has got weaselly bloke but um i could maybe embarrass him into making a decision without him or something well at least uh they're he's honest in front legit. of us he's going legit if he's um working for the algatas yeah paul gno who's the second um clearly not a native delk by but he's got that i wouldn't say sleazy but he's got an urbane clever calculating manner about it. He's clearly somebody who's been around the block a number of times. Nobody carries a scimitar around with a group of cutthroats if you don't know how to use it. But he's clearly the thinker in the group. I suppose, not to be rude, Cran, he's Ugnan's um, equivalent. Can he cook, though? No, <laughs> I, he's, he's beyond me. I cook? No, I, I hire. I hire people to do it. <laughs> I, uh, no, no, cooking not for me. Uh, I tell you, Agnum cooks up a nice bit of root. You can try my, my, my <laughs> wyvern. Oh, now, that might be something you might have to be careful of. If, <laughs> um, at some point, if Aroth, or particularly Faulkner, realises that one of you is addicted to root, hmm, the letter's going to get very interesting. <laughs> okay. So, Aroth is quite happy to... Um, I say happy. Aroth is keen, because Faulkner sees an advantage in to sign a letter of mark. He will help you attack the ship. So he says, so when is this going to happen? When When is the ship due? You said a week? week, maybe just yeah, under. We don't, we don't know exactly. It's probably uh, five days plus, five to eight days away. All right. He says, so uh, look, the likelihood is, if you uh, if you don't know the layout of the island, that the, really the only way to approach the island, if they come, and they come in city as well. Yeah. Yeah, we just got to jump on them. So, yeah, looking for the same right. stuff we are. But for well, the only way in, they're bound to come across bound to come near this stockade. So I suppose a simple idea would be let them discover the uh, stockade, group of us in here, um, we ambush them, and then march them back to the ship and take the ship. But, you know, simple. How, how tough are these boys? Quite tough. Yeah, I suspect quite tough. Magic user amongst them. Sorcerer. But lady there, she can she can handle that stuff, can Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, him, and he points across to uh, you, Numa. So uh, I know he's one of them CL. Good in a fight, is he? What's his skill? I can handle myself. Well, so can I. I've been on this island on my own. For... I came back tonight from the temple. He looks at you and says, all right, all right, I'll get it, I'll get it. So this this city, I, I still don't understand. You you came here in that airship willingly to go into the. I mean, if you think the temple was tough, and I get it, and he looks across at all of you, making eye contact with many of you. I understand that it's really dangerous. To turn you new male, so you can handle yourself. But the city, trust me, that is, that's got to be a level above. It's full of demons just getting into the city, trying to get in. Almost killed. Really? Look, mate, you don't get it. We have to do this. No matter I the risk. We have certain Look, skills. Well, I hope those skills are dodging <clears throat> fire that is fired from the wall. There is a great big red wall that goes around the entire island. We try to climb over the walls, and there are these, well, these, these like statues that are on the wall, and they fire firebolts i'm not kidding fire comes out of these things eyes and that took out some of the lads and the gate which is the only way in is a demon now, i don't mean 
a thing with like wings and claws i mean a bloody great big 50 foot demon a great big mouth now as far as i could see that was the only way in but mm. i yeah. can help you with that so well you you already have there's well a, no there's a password for the door isn't there how do you know that well we know more now we know the password itself you know the password how do you find that out it took us ages it's in a book what book a book in the temple. Oh, right. I was thinking of them. I was waiting for you to drop me some. Uh, no. The one that... Uh, the one that we found in the it. tower that we're not supposed to go <laughs> to your headquarters. <laughs> um, oh, right. Because, uh, okay. Well, if you know the password, then, that is your only way in. Otherwise, just getting in, well, that's... that's. I mean, it took us through trial and error to figure out what the password is. Well... What is it then? What do you think it is? Well, that's just the case. We need to know how to pronounce the password. It's written down, of course. Oh, all, right. To me. all right. He smiles and he says, look, as a gesture of tr and faith, and he looks at you, Cran, and nods, the password that we've used to get in is, and he tells you what it is, Teraglustrod, which matches what you've got in your book. Say that, and the demon will basically let you in. The demon's going to appear. Don't attack God's sake. Don't attack it. Even if you know the password, it will just it will react. If you tell it what the, what your password is, it will open its mouth wide. It will stick out its tongue, and I swear you just walk across its tongue. Walk across its tongue. Go straight into its mouth, and you come out the other side. I don't know how it works. I don't know why it works. I don't even know what it's doing there. But that's how you get in. After that, I don't know of anything that is going to keep those demons, ghosts, and the other horrors that are in there off you. They'll eat your face. How um, how do you get back out again, then? He looks at you and says, will you go straight out the gate? Again, I don't know how it worked. That that face, that, that horrible face that that thing has, faces both ways. Uh, only this time, there's no tongue, because that tongue crosses the water. You just walk into its mouth. And then you appear on the other end of the tongue, walking onto the road. I don't know how it works. He shakes his head. Don't ask me. And Ara, if and you say, Ara, no, and Pogno doesn't say make it even make it. So let, let's say we've just walked through the tongue. We're on the other side. What are we going yeah. to see immediately in front of us? Is it going to be demons in the streets, or are they hiding, or, or they come at night? What what is it? Well, we went we went during the day. And uh, you'll see things moving around, uh, shapes. Um, some, some of the lads thought they were, they were some of the crew, which was daft, because we knew the crew had died. But, um, you know, we, um, they, they, they were just, well, we thought they were crew. Some of the lads wouldn't listen and ran after them and just never came back. Um, so you'll see shapes moving around. They might look like some of you lot. Like, like your crew. They might look like your brother, your sister. Don't believe it. Everything you see in there is a lie. Don't trust anything. You'll see pet dogs. You'll see the cat that you had when you were a nipper. It won't. It, it'll, it'll eat you. It'll kill you. Everything in there is a lie. The whole place, a lie. We, we went in there hoping to find something to get us to cursed place. Oh, we just lost. What was it, Paul? No. Ah, many. There's a dozen, a dozen, chief, a dozen. We lost a dozen. You're all lies, lies. Oh dear, we have to tie a bloody rope round silk, don't we? And that's where we'll leave this episode. Ooh, a bit scary sounding this demon-infested city, as we knew already. Looks like we'll have to get through that mouth, and then hopefully ignore everything and not go mad. As usual, thanks very much for watching or listening, however you do this thing. Thanks very much if you subscribe or you liked all that other kind of stuff. Uh, not much else for me to say, really. Check out the description for anything else. And thanks again. Catch you next time. Cheers.